Consistent Software uh, from 2016 onwards. Previously, he had worked in different organizations in different roles, such as senior project manager in Wix, soft technologies, IT consultant, etc. He assisted SME firms in automating of monitoring their energy plans, developed Android and web-based platform to showcase omni-channel to small firms. Till now, he has more than 17 years of experience in corporate sector, which means a lot for us. Uh, Mr. Kameshwaran received his Bachelor in Engineering in Information Technology from Mumbai University in 2004 and uh, completed different courses like uh, Go, Quantum Computing, Deep Learning, PMP, Information Security, Auditors Module, FEDAI, uh, NSE, Currency Features, etc. etc. Uh, Mr. Kati Kameshwaran is the recipient of various professional and academic awards like I Appreciate Quarterly Performance Award, that is top 1% employee in 2007. He received the Team Award quarterly for the quarterly performance, that is top 1% uh, team in 2007 itself. And also managed the, a key project that helped the company back CNBC NASCOM IT User Award in 2009, which with his uh, huge experience and uh, uh, the past uh, sessions and uh, talks in related to quantum computing, uh, I'd like to invite you, sir, to start your session, please. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so some of the participants might have already known me uh, from the earlier uh, session we had about uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so this being an advanced topic, I'm going to quickly jump into uh, the, the the topic uh, quantum search algorithms. Um, so in in a classical computer, uh, one of the uh, one of the major uh, you know challenges or one of the key areas of research has always been about uh, searching a particular uh, data. Now this could be uh, a sorted uh, data, it could be an unsorted data, it could be um, you know it could be a list, it could be um, it could be an ordered list, or it could be uh, any such uh, data structure. And uh, with different different data structures, when we have to search and uh, retrieve a particular data, uh, there is a different level of complexity depending upon what kind of uh, or uh, how structured, sorted the data is, so on and so forth. And if you look at uh, some of the very common use cases that we have, uh, we do have a lot of uh, what we call as unsorted dictionary. A uh, database typically gives you uh, a better uh, representation of data by means of giving uh, indexes and by means of retrieving data by, uh, you know, storing them in uh, trees and so on and so forth. So, uh, so each database has its own way of, uh, you know, handling uh, data uh, retrieval, uh, searching and retrieval. And depending upon what database you use, some of them might be tuned for, uh, or, uh, you know, they, their algorithms might be more tuned for retrieval. Some of them would be more tuned for writes. Uh, so an RDBMS would be uh, more likely to be tuned for uh, uh, data write and consistency as against something like a MongoDB, which is uh, more optimized towards uh, read, uh, read operations or something like an Elastic, which is far more, uh, you know, tuned. So Elastic, uh, you know, the, uh, data store uses uh, what we uh, know, uh, know as KNN approach. Uh, K nearest neighbor uh, approach to be able to quickly uh, search through the data. So there are various search techniques and uh, there are dozens of uh, algorithms that exist in a classical computer uh, to be able to search them. But all of them typically have a fairly high, uh, you know, uh, search and retrieval time. Uh, if you have to look at a very simple classical uh, you know search uh, problem that we when we have an unsorted dictionary and we really do not know that um, you know what would be the what is the exact uh, data that we want so maybe we could be looking at uh, retrieving multiple uh, records or be able uh, or just wanting to search one record at a time so let's say uh, from a pizza delivery time, if you look at a table in, uh, you know, the delivery time of all the different delivery times, if we want to find what is the fastest 
or uh, if you want to look at specifically at a particular number for 14.9 or let's say uh, 14.0 Okay, so you will find that you can have one or uh, more responses for them, or probably even no response. Okay, and fastest uh, pizza delivery time, you will always get the lowest value. So uh, if you have an unsorted data like this, you are definitely going to have various different uh, performances from this. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, exhaustive searching is something that is uh, that's that's unavoidable in some of the scenarios, uh, especially when you want to look at all the occurrences of a particular value. So you will have to definitely uh, iterate uh, through a, through various values, or at least uh, you know have certain indexes which will be able to create, uh, which will be able to give you a faster uh, searching mechanism. But in either case, uh, you know, if, if you have to look at the overall computational uh, uh, cost, it is going to be fairly high. Okay, and uh, if you have to uh, unoptimized, un, uh, you know, uh, what you can say, um, the very basic search. If you have to do an exhaustive search and do a comparison and retrieve the values, uh, your average uh, classical uh, system will require an, uh, on an average, um, you know. Um, the uh, you know O of n by two, which is like let's say if you have uh, one million uh, records, then your uh, average is going to be half a million, and at worst it's going to be one million search. Okay, uh, if you want to retrieve a single value, if you want to retrieve a multiple value, then obviously you are going to look at uh, you know O n. So you have to look for uh, or compare all the one million records. And uh, let's say if you have even a, uh, let's say uh, if you want to find out the puzzle, I mean crossword puzzle, and you want to find out uh, the actual word. So you know that it is, uh, let's say, seven letter word. So seven letter word, you find that there is a million, uh, you know, seven letter words that you can have. And out of those million, you might want to uh, look at, uh, you know, what would be the the values for this. So the answer for this is obviously Pirana. But if you uh, have to look through those, uh, you know, 1 million, so you will have to look at all the various possibilities and see which of them actually fits. Because you can't, uh, uh, you know, uh, you cannot exit at the first uh, iteration. You might have to want to uh, look at all the different options and uh, then subsequently decide uh, which one to uh, use in the crossword. Okay. But the, the whole problem here is that the search is going to take time. And we want to definitely find the solution to be a little faster. And uh, quantum computing, as we know, is uh, definitely a solution where uh, we can, uh, you know, we can have a speed up. And in some of the problems, we have already seen that it gives you, uh, you know, speed up primarily because you are going to complete the entire operation in uh, one step. Okay. Uh, or it could be in multiple iterations, but essentially the solution within uh, each iteration is arrived in a single step. So that's that's a whole premise of uh, you know having a quantum computer. So uh, we we want to know if we can have a good solution to this. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the most common, or rather the most uh, popular, uh, you know, uh, search algorithm in quantum computer is uh, uh, Grover's algorithm. And uh, Grover's algorithm is uh, based on uh, the concept of uh, selective inversion. We'll come to what is a selective inversion. We will also look at other some of the other, uh, you know, problem statement. Okay, that um, that could arise. So some of the problem statement that we might want to look at um, could be also, uh, let's say, finding a specific card in a shuffled uh, deck, right? So that's also one of the problem statements. Okay, so in all the, the you know, Grover's uh, search algorithm, the first concept is uh, called as an oracle. Okay, so what is an oracle? Uh, so Oracle is basically to tell, uh, you know, if the card that you are uh, looking at is uh, is basically the one that you want. Okay. And uh, it's, it's basically to evaluate a card, right? <clears throat> so in this, uh, when we say Oracle function, uh, it is just to make sure that we are finding a specific card. 
or if you are looking for a, a seven letter uh, crossword uh, word puzzle word um, so you might want to look at uh, whether it satisfies my constraints of uh, you know my third letter to be uh, r uh, or something like that so those are some of the things that we might want to look so basically what what really happens is that we have to understand uh, you know uh, the concept of uh, selective inversion where uh, you have specific bits okay um, so the target elements if you are uh, looking uh, if the, you have a matrix uh, representation of uh, of the target cu qubit so the uh, target qubit will have uh, let's say if you are taking a two qubit system so we'll start with a two qubit system then we will expand the uh, two qubit system into uh, higher uh, equations okay so what we want to do is we have a specific state that we have to uh, look at and uh, uh, for the uh, target uh, qubit and we have to invert the amplitude for those states why do we have to imp uh, invert the amplitude for a simple reason uh, when we when we actually have uh, you know uh, when we have a regular uh, uh, diagonal matrix okay and uh, if we have uh, what is the mean okay if you have to arrive at a mean uh, for the states right so then we have specific uh, values for each of the uh, you know qubit combinations so we will have specific uh, means now for these specific means if we have to uh, increase the amplitude okay as in if we have to uh, let's say increase the amplitude of a particular uh, frequency okay and because that is our uh, you know target state that we we want to look at okay and if if that is the value that we want to look at we want to ensure that the amplitude of that is uh, you know increased okay so how do we increase that we uh, in a standard uh, one matrix uh, diagonal matrix we will uh, we will invert that particular uh, you know uh, qubit state and we will make that as minus 1 okay um so this is not actual qubit representation when we say minus 1 it's not an actual qubit representation it's it's more of a matrix representation where we are uh, mentioning it we'll come back to this in a moment okay um so so the first step is to understand, uh, you know, how do we uh, define the uh, input state? Okay. Um, so uh, the input states, obviously, you will have uh, n uh, qubits. Uh, so for the n qubits, you will have uh, two raised to n uh, different states. Okay. And uh, we have to define this oracle function. So which means that uh, it will, uh, you know, it will have to return zero. Okay, for uh, all the combinations except the one that we really want. So we want to ensure that we get only one particular state uh, which is clear and which has got the, uh, you know, which is our, uh, uh, you know, the state that we wanted, the output that we want. And uh, we will encode uh, the the inputs in such a way that, uh, you know, uh, we, will, we will have a series of uh, quantum gates, obviously. So we will do it in such a way that we are creating this whole uh, search criteria as a as a function, Oracle, uh, you know, uh, as an Oracle function, and uh, we have to, um, you know, we have to ensure that we are, uh, you know, the, we are amplifying uh, the probability, okay, uh, which which will match the search criteria. And if we have to in, uh, increase the amplitude, so how do we in, uh, increase the amplitude? We can use uh, uh, a typical uh, CCN gate, okay, or uh, or a C naught gate if it is uh, if it is uh, you know a two uh, qubit system, or if it's a three qubit system, uh, then we will we will have to have uh, uh, we'll have a CCN uh, gate, okay. So in all the conditions, we will have a gate representation all of all of them. So if you look at, uh, if you quickly have a look at uh, this particular, uh, uh, you know, condition. So what we are seeing here is this box essentially represents your search criteria. 
okay so this basically uh, does your pre processing of increasing the probability of the state that we want and uh, we also do a conditional compare which says that uh, if yeah, do i have uh, you know the the requisite for that particular qubit do i have the uh, answer as one okay uh, so how do we uh, do it we go back to that uh, you know idea of uh, uh, of having that uh, amplitude uh, inversion right now this alone is not going to solve your problems okay so we will have to do this uh, for each of the uh, uh, you know items that we want to do so uh, if we have multiple search then we have to run multiple iterations uh, for a sim single um, multiple iterations for that uh, single data set right but your uh, function essentially look uh, looking at uh, uh, the overall what we can say as the same uh, you know search criteria but it's just that we are looking at different different uh, data points to iterate upon that is when you are talking of search as a whole okay but even within the search uh it's not uh, possible for you to have uh, you know one uh, search uh, doing the entire uh, search space completely in one shot so obviously there are going to be again iterations for uh, these uh, data points because now your unstructured data is not going to be a fixed length all the time so even for the uh, or the data uh, space that we have so the data space we will have to uh, do an iteration so again you will have uh, iterations even for that okay um so uh, that that's uh, you know those are two aspects of iterations and uh, the last is, uh, is to obviously uh, you know measure the the probabilities because as we know from uh, standard uh, quantum computing we know that uh, your answers are not going to be accurate all the time due to uh, you know quantum imperfections or material imperfections as we may say or the external interferences or uh, due to the measuring uh, inaccuracies so there are, are going to be various factors due to which errors can creep in and uh, apart from that obviously your uh, overall uh, you know search space if you have you might want to uh, ensure that if you are unaware of what is the probability that you are looking at you might want to run more iterations to get uh, a higher amplitude of probability for uh, or a higher probability for the amplitude that you are looking at so so if you look at uh, on the on the right hand side if you look at a standard uh, you know ccn so uh, we would be looking at um, a target qubit and we have to control the uh, qubits which are going to be uh, the data qubits okay and uh, basis of this data qubit we want to ensure that we have a yes or a no okay basis of uh, and uh, the target qubit is going to be controlled by x and y okay and uh, all of them obviously belong to the space of zeros and ones uh, so we are uh, going to look at uh, a ccn gate here but this is not going to be the only uh, uh, you know uh, bit qubit okay this this can also be visualized as uh, another uh, another iteration in which where we say that we have a search register which we give to uh, the first step okay and we have a check qubit or a target qubit okay which is going to give you a signal okay for each of the qubits so the qubits are going to encode them and going to give it to the first uh, check qubit and this is again given to the step 2 now step 2 is going to consider other qubits so on and so forth you you keep uh, increasing it or you keep running this whole iterations for uh, r number of iterations so that at the end when you are getting an output you get an output for all the uh, you know uh, input uh, you know, data qubits for all the data qubits you will find that you have uh, an output of zeros or ones so you will have exactly only one output where you get one the rest should be zeros but usually that's not the case sometimes you will get uh, different ones and that's why you plot a histogram for it uh, to see which one of them has got the highest or look at the you know actual probability outputs and choose the uh, ones with the highest probability 
and in a typical uh, uh, you know search algorithm what we say is uh, any uh, search probability that's uh, over uh, 95% uh, is considered to be a very good uh, search logic in some of the cases uh, we might probably also want to look at a slightly lower probability uh, uh, and also it depends on the number of iterations the more number of iterations you will run you will get us the you know much much uh, reliable output so um, we would recommend uh, you know running some of the iterations for at least 1024 or 2000 or probably 10000 so those are some of the numbers that you should be running depending upon how complex your uh, search is and also how uh, good your uh, you know equipment uh, are Okay, in an emulator, typically you will find uh, the number to be very, very high, but uh, in an actual hardware, you will find the uh, you know result actually varies quite a bit. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so there is uh, one more example that we have uh, uh, when when it comes to uh, searching, we can uh, look at uh, you know um, a neighbor to neighbor kind of a communication setup, a grid of data points probability. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably and uh, what we have here is uh, we have um, a step which is going to give you uh, or what we can say um, a series of data points which are organized in a neighbor to neighbor uh, distribution okay out here if we simply have to search for a particular data uh, in a classical scenario you would be requiring uh, nine iterations whereas if you are looking at uh, quantum we are looking at uh, three iterations. Three iterations when we say uh, three steps uh, within which we can identify the uh, sample data. So the reason why we find that is we are able to operate on uh, different combinations, and uh, we don't have to hand. Uh, you don't have to search for individual node one at a time. You would rather uh, do it for at least uh, if you start with three qubits you can do it in uh, three uh, iterations okay and uh, this is this is for a uh, you know a nine node uh, setup but if you are looking at uh, you know more nodes obviously it's going to be uh, a square root of that number this is also particularly useful in if you can relate to classical computing in classical computing you have a concept called as uh, data partitioning in a database Right. So in RDBMS, there is a concept of data partitioning over a particular, uh, you know, field and uh, the data partition. And there are various combinations to do data partitioning. Now, data partitioning in a classical uh, DB, uh, typically what it does is it uses a hash function so that it's able to quickly. Uh, I mean, the common one is a hash function to be able to quickly identify the partition from which to search the data. But once it identifies from which node it has to search the data, what it typically does is it will uh, have to go through the entire database again. So it doesn't have to it have that entire uh, you know partition data completely. Out here, if you are look, uh, combining it with a quantum search, the advantage that you will get is uh, from a classical computer, you would be able to quickly uh, come down to the node to which you are uh, or the partition uh, the data partition where you want to search and within the data partition you can represent them as uh, you know connected uh, dots or the connected data so because all of the data now within a data partition is now uh, more or less connected by uh, that uh, partition field correct okay? so they do have certain relation between them now that relation can be used uh, to do a quantum search. Okay, um, if if we have to look at uh, a special quantum searching, okay, uh, in uh, from another concept uh, that if you have to go from uh, you know let's say uh, from one uh, starting point and if you have to go to uh, a highlighted particular uh, you know graph node, okay, so if if we have, uh, you know, let's say total of nine uh, nodes here, right? So nine nodes, uh, you will require in a worst case scenario, you will require to hop through all the nine different nodes uh, to reach them. But in this particular case, when we have uh, a quantum search, we will require uh, specifically, this is, this is very similar to a, uh, uh, you know, where uh, you have to routing, uh, you know, algorithms. 
so routing algorithms are uh, particularly notorious for uh, you know being computationally intensive okay so uh, uh, this is this is one of those uh, routing uh, logic where you will have to route from one node to another but for for that you will have to first identify uh, which is the node that you actually want to go through and uh, then identify what is the node through which you want to go through okay I, I, out here we will go through in uh, three steps so in the shortest uh, you know path if you see we will go in three steps but if you have to identify in a classical computer you will uh, perform uh, a lot of iterations to find out uh, this particular uh, you know the shortest path okay whereas uh, you know if, if you look at uh, some of the classical uh, heuristics uh, techniques it might probably for a simple one it might uh, probably be faster with a classical computer but if you are having uh, more and more uh, data points uh, which are represented of nodes obviously uh, in a graph so then obviously you will you will have the complexity to be much much higher that is where your quantum computer uh, comes into play okay and um, what are the steps then how do we how do we actually go about uh, you know in a quantum computing how do we go about uh, executing a quantum search okay the first step is to ensure that you have all the qubits in the uh, zero state okay and you create a uniform uh, superposition for all the uh, you know basis inputs so uh, if you create a, so a uniform superposition you would be able to then perform the operation on those uh, on the target qubit right then what you do is uh, uh, you uh, execute the oracle function along with uh, uh, you know grover's uh, diffusion operator now the grover's diffusion operator is your uh, inversion uh, that we had seen okay so if you look at uh, the inversion so once we arrive at uh, the function uh, right once we uh, you know get the oracle okay we will we will have to look at uh, the diffusion operator okay so the diffusion operator will essentially tell you that uh, you know your uh, you know what is what is the particular target value that we want to amplify because if we do not amplify if we only look at an oracle it is just going to tell you the probability okay an oracle function is going to only tell you a probability but here what you are essentially doing is by using selective inversion you are amplifying the uh, you know probabilities of those states uh, which you require right so uh, that is why this is the this diffusion technique uh, you know step is very essential for us to be able to um, do it so um, so the diffusion operator in fact uh, some of them uh, call it amplitude purification some of them call it amplitude increasing uh, increasing your uh, amplitude um, so so there are various different terminologies that people use okay and uh, what it does is uh, it, it takes the first step in that is to obviously find the mean uh, of the uh, the probabilities right uh, which you can represent as let's say a mu and uh, that value can can then be uh, inverted okay and uh, uh, around this uh, mean you actually invert the values so why do we invert the values uh, because uh, this this inversion will essentially tell you uh, the specific target value and without which you'll, your inversion or your uh, mean doesn't have a value by itself a mean if you take the mean of uh, of all the probabilities that's not going to tell you anything so if you will have to arrive at the probabilities which you really want and around the mean you will have to uh, you know invert those probabilities okay and when you invert those probabilities around that mean you are going to get the uh, the, the the highest probability state okay and why you do this uh, uh, repeatedly uh, as i had told earlier because uh, with one particular uh, you know data point you would have um, a target state uh, you know probability amplitude now you will have to keep amplifying it so uh, so it could either converge or diverge so with uh, each additional iteration the number could keep uh, you know uh, changing so we are going to look at a small example here uh, which is going to look at uh, how we how we have different values uh, basis of uh, different uh, you know uh, iterations so we will we are going to have look at a, the, the sample program of uh, grower search okay 
so uh, so the grover if you if you look at uh, the grover logic alone uh, you could call it as a quantum kernel uh, in in an uh, you know open qasm uh, it is uh, or an open ql uh, it is called as uh, the quantum kernel um, some of them might just call it uh, in the physical layout you would be calling it as a sub circuit uh, but then uh, you would essentially have again um, you know two different parts in it one one um, uh, you know sub circuit is going to be oracle and the second is going to be the diffusion operator okay and we can essentially we can do it uh, twice okay um, out here uh, so that we are able to get um, you know for two different uh, qubits uh, different uh, inputs okay but we can also do it uh, n number of times depending upon how uh, accurate your uh, how less accurate the data is uh, but again it's going to uh, take uh, too much of computing capabilities okay so the choice is with us to uh, find out if uh, if we have the specific uh, value okay and how accurate the value we are having okay um one important factor here is that if we are running the code on an emulator we don't require an actual measurement to be done because your emulator invariably is going to uh, you know fetch the value and give it to you but in a in a physical uh, quantum computer we need to uh, run a measurement uh, uh, you know the gate measurement uh, operator okay um, so that is something that we will have to do and uh, then obviously to uh, we will we'll have to plot the data okay and we we are going to look at uh, some of the uh, data points now any questions till now okay so i'm going to quickly uh, reshare my uh, screen um, so let me okay um i hope um, the screen is visible okay so i have uh, uh, signed up uh, in in a website called as uh, quantum inspire it is provided by um, uh, an institution called as qtech and uh, we have two different uh, uh, projects here so i'll come to the second one later or the first one later so the this is uh, this is a grover uh, mm, uh, sorry um, so we have a grover algorithm here okay so um so what we are going to do is we are going to assume that our uh, database is of the size of uh, eight okay and we have to find uh, the decimal number six in it okay as your uh, database size increases the number of qubits uh, that you have is going to increase so let's say if you have uh, you know one million data points so obviously this is uh, you will need uh, uh, 30 qubits right um, sorry uh, 20 qubits and if you have uh, 1 billion data points then you will require 30 qubits which is particularly interesting because uh, you know if you have to uh, do this in one shot okay and if you have to return the data in milliseconds uh, and uh, if you have to have if you are having a, a billion data points so uh, you can you can definitely use a 30 qubit system and if you have let's say a trillion data points that is where the speed up of quantum really comes into pay, play is that uh, if you have um, a trillion data points you just need uh, 40 qubits to be able to solve the problem and again you will get the solution in uh, let's say uh you know a few milliseconds and in a worst case scenario in a second or so whereas if you are looking at uh, the same to be done in a classical database or even in a classical computer when you start looking at a trillion data points uh, it's definitely definitely going to be pretty slow okay and even with uh, some of the optimization techniques and indexing techno uh, techniques you will still find that uh, the lookup is going to be fairly uh, expensive okay and that's that's a power uh, so now out here we are going to look at a particular uh, value which is going to be uh, 6 okay and 
what we have is uh, first we are initializing uh, uh, to a hedge gate so uh, just to recall the hedge gate uh, puts all of your uh, uh, you know qubits into a superposition with equal probabilities and that is exactly what we need here uh, we want complete randomness so that uh, we and equal randomness uh, or rather equal uh, superposition values so that we are able to arrive at um, arrive at the solution uh, without having any bias to the uh, inputs okay so uh, that is what we have the next is uh, the oracle function so oracle function if you look at um, uh, just to just to highlight this particular point so the oracle function that you have uh, is out here um, the these are the x gates which is going to be your uh, your uh, control bits okay then you have uh, your uh, the hedge gate okay and together all all these together form your oracle okay why does it why do you have to have uh, a hedge gate uh, uh, again out here for the uh, for the target qubit is uh, to be able to take it into superposition first um, and then apply the um, apply the uh, operator okay um, a controlled operator and which is uh, which is going to be a toffoli gate okay and uh, when you apply a toffoli uh, gate you are going to uh, once again uh, you know have an output and uh, subsequently you perform the uh, the diffusion okay so when you perform the diffusion what you will have essentially is uh, once again you are putting the iteration you are uh, applying the hedge gate and then you are applying the x gate and then a hedge gate now hedge gate is applied uh, specifically only to the the second qubit um, which is your target qubit for a reason that you are only interested in uh, uh, reducing uh, you know this is your inversion okay so this is the inversion uh, that we saw because in a hedge uh, gate if you see the representation matrix representation uh, is going to be um, is going to be um, you know an inversion right um, so so that is why we are doing it and this is particularly for uh, for only one bit so out here we are looking for a specific value so we are looking only at one qubit okay uh, here and uh, once again we apply the the fully gate okay so this this we do a two step operation uh, just to make sure that we are increasing the amplitude here okay we uh, we perform this operation um, second time and once we in increase the amplitude we will uh, get a final answer we could extend this i mean uh, the whole diffusion process we could uh, make it more repeated in nature so as to get uh, a better control or a better output uh, in terms of uh, amplitude values in terms of probabilities but that's going to increase the uh, the overall uh, what you can say uh, execution time okay uh, what I have taken is uh, I'm taking experiment number one. The number of shots that I'm going to take are only 256 right now. Okay. And uh, this is an emulator. Okay. This is not a uh, actual hardware. Okay. So uh, we are going to run 256 uh, iterations here. Okay. Uh, the next thing what we, are, what we are going to do is we will uh, run the same logic now instead of... Uh, uh, 256 iterations we are now going to run 1024 iterations okay so we will see a slightly improved uh, result okay uh, any questions on this till now okay so if you look at uh, so this is 110 which is obviously uh, value 6 and uh, if you look here, uh, your 256 iterations um, executed in 0 0.01 second. Okay. And your probability is uh, 0.93, uh, which is again fairly good for the number that we are looking for. Uh, but we are we are still not pretty uh, having a pretty good uh, uh, probability. Let's say if I have a threshold of 95%, this will not make the cut. Okay. Uh, let's quickly go back to the experiment number two. Now, if you see here, uh, when I do it for 1024, the probability has uh, increased to uh, 0.95. Okay. So uh, th that is something that uh, we, we would be happy to do. 
okay and uh, if you if you look at uh, this particular uh, data uh, we could uh, also uh, make an observation that we uh, we have done it for two iteration so if we do it for three it's uh, going to uh, give us slightly more uh, accurate data okay and doing the foley again okay and i'm going to do this okay this i also want to do this before that i do the the foley gate okay so this is something that uh, we can run again and i can run this again for 256 okay um so the probability obviously is going to um, you know kind of vary every time that you run and also it's going to vary depending upon how uh, how well tuned your uh, solution is okay and uh, you will find there is a particular uh, change in the values now okay so uh, if you look at uh, why we have uh, why we saw a, a drastic change in the probabilities is that now the the zero that we have because we have done the third uh, iteration so what it has done is essentially the 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 changes that it applied for the toffoli uh, and the hedge gate okay so specifically with the uh, toffoli and the x gate rather okay so uh, those have uh, definitely increased the amplitude of probability for uh, bit number 0 which has now increased so if you see all the bit number zeros okay uh, you will find that the probabilities have definitely increased and uh, you know for uh, 110 we do have uh, very less probability okay and so this particular skew if you see you will find that we need to now look at the x gate operators here okay so the x gate operator is definitely is causing the probability change for this so uh, it's a completely different solution right now because you are now amplitude you are increasing the amplitude for uh, for the uh, the zero bit again okay now if you do this uh, diffusion again okay if you do this uh, diffusion again you will find a slightly different value again now you will find a uh, more uh, towards the uh, the second qubit so the second qubit is going to uh, get slightly more uh, 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 probabilities right okay so you now see that all the probabilities for the second qubit has increased okay for whereas for the first uh, qubit the probability has not changed much but now the second uh, qubit probability has increased a lot okay and which is also given back your uh, uh, your uh, decimal number 7 so this is this is particularly interesting because now every time you are going to make a change to the uh, x operator okay because uh, whenever uh, sorry you are applying an x uh, gate you are uh, definitely you are making a change to one of those qubits okay now <clears throat> sorry now if i go back to applying only the uh, the original gates okay but now we are going to run it for uh, let's say uh, 4096 okay now the 4096 is definitely going to take uh, you know uh, slightly more time okay uh, it has taken 0.2 seconds okay and there is definitely a certain level of noise and you see that from 256 to 1024 you saw a drastic improvement in the particular uh, probability and you find that the probabilities uh, are not changing a lot uh, when moving from 1024 to 4096 the reason is your uh, the, the the noise is going to definitely going to cause a problem for all the iterations i mean at at some point your probabilities are not going to always be uh, 100% okay now if we uh, rerun for exactly the same uh, okay now the sixth experiment we uh, run for 4096 uh, we are not going to get the same values okay 
you will find definitely there is a slight improvement but again you will keep uh, repeating this uh, problems uh, repeating this simulation you will get uh, you know different values okay uh, then if we look at uh, some of the other uh, you know pointers with respect to uh, a quantum computing okay uh, we will also find that uh, we can apply the same problem to uh, uh, as we saw you know traversing between the various nodes of the data okay and uh, this can extend it to your uh, what we can say um, traveling salesman problem because now you have to search for uh, the the end node or the the last node right and you have to do it with the least probability or the least cost okay or you could look at uh, a specific uh, you know path that you want to go with or you are looking at maximizing the profit okay so various different uh, you know target functions can be mapped to your uh, your grower search because your grower search that way uh, allows you to perform the inversion uh, for the target uh, depending upon the values that you are looking at and um, so if you are uh, if you are looking to minimize the value so if you know that what is going to be a possible minimum um, as against uh, quantum annealing uh, quantum universal gates uh, can take a very standard approach in solving it um, whereas in a quantum annealing you will have to um, you know specifically write a cost function which is going to be um, specific for that problem whereas the universal uh, quantum computer will take only the um, what we can say the the standard uh, inversion uh, logic and you, it can extend okay one particular uh, aspect we have to know here is if you are looking at a very large uh, data points let's say we spoke about uh, let's say 1 million or 1 trillion uh, data points and if we are taking 40 qubits now this 40 qubits if you have to represent and if you have to write a uh, um, the the gates for all the 40 okay it's going to be definitely uh, very very expensive okay because accessing the all the 40 qubits at once is extremely expensive and uh, second thing is in terms of uh, computational capability also if you are going to use 40 qubits at once your uh, ability to pass the data both input and output at the classical side should also be equally good so because you are uh, if you're looking for a particular standard uh, search you will have to be able to map them uh, to an intermediate step um, in a quantum computer and that is where the tools are specifically not very great right now so a quantum uh, a gross search algorithm today finds applicability in parts so they they use what we call as uh, you know uh, breaking down the problem so uh, instead of going for 40 qubits at once today we go for let's say five or six qubits at once and we take uh, problem kernels and each of the problem kernels we break it down in such a way it is much more manageable uh, it may not give you the full 2x uh, 2 raised to x uh, speed up but internally when you start looking at uh, let's say uh, 5 5 qubits at once if you take uh, so you will have eight different groups so you will be able to search 240 uh, data points uh, in one uh, iteration okay and if you are having let's say if you are able to execute it in let's say under uh, you know 10 milliseconds okay uh, for let's say 240 data points you do this iteration for a million times um, so you get basically um, or you do it for let's say um, you know a billion times so for this you do it uh, you will require quite a bit of time but on the other hand if you are uh, from a uh, from a purely from a uh, you know what we see in an ibm kiskit uh, setup um, it is slightly more the composer is slightly better at handling uh, um, handling the uh, decomposition okay so uh, if you are getting an because ibm uh, quantum hardware you get only about 5 qubits at a time uh, out here uh, in the quantum inspire that we saw we saw that um, you know just to give you a quick view um, you know in quantum inspire um, you will find that um, you know if i'm taking a new project okay uh, uh, the starmon 5 okay is the one which gives you 5 qubits 
okay the the spin 2 actually gives you only two, two qubits but it's not available for past few days the other two are uh, simulators okay um so uh, any of the freely available ones won't give you more than let's say um, you know four six qubits at once um so that's that's one of the problems but if you have access to a dedicated quantum computer you might be able to expand it to let's say um 16 qubits at once so the moment you have 16 qubits you are essentially looking at uh, uh, you know 64 uh, 65000 you know data points that you can search in one uh, iteration which means in 10 milliseconds you will be looking at 65000 and let's say you have a 64 qubit um, you know uh, quantum computer and if you have four uh, such data frames uh, that you are looking at so you are essentially looking at uh, a quarter million data points to be searched in um, uh, what 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds and uh, today if i am going to do the same search in a standard rdbms a quarter million data points uh, at once uh, i would be taking you know essentially slightly more more milliseconds than that okay uh, so that is where we are still not yet uh, reached the quantum supremacy uh, but when you are uh, when you are quantum uh, computer like uh, ibm's 127 qubit uh, computer is going to come up uh, we would be able to uh, perform uh, more operations and the SDKs that and uh, you know integrations that they are coming up with, they are saying that uh, in another one year our uh, you know integrations and our output should be able to handle uh, those classical processing, post and pre-processing for even for uh, let's say um, you know 32 or 40 qubits at once. So if you are performing those uh, 32 and or even 40 qubits at once you are looking at uh, an extremely high speed up so the entire data space can be searched at once and even if you are looking at 20 um, so you are looking at a million data points to be searched in again 10 uh, 10 second uh, 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds so that is going to be a phenomenal speed up as against the classical computer your classical computer can only scale linearly here on right so uh, that's about the uh, the grover uh, you know search logic uh, any any other questions on uh, uh, Grover uh, before we move on? Okay. So uh, let me. Let me quickly unshare this. Okay. Okay, a slightly less, uh, you know, complex and uh, fairly simple, uh, you know, um, algorithm is uh, Doijosa uh, algorithm. Okay, while this is not a truly, uh, you know, massive uh, speed up, we will be getting uh, what we can call as uh, a minor uh, speed up as against a classical uh, search okay um, so the algorithm that what they uh, they typically talk about is that um, they want to find out if a particular function has got is balanced or or constant okay um, so being balanced is uh, is a test uh, for the for this algorithm of Doijosa, and uh, uh, we again use an oracle. Um, so if it is uh, constant or balanced, okay, and uh, we say it is constant if for all values, if it is either zero or one. If it's for all the inputs, uh, if it is uh, zero or one. But um, you know, for if for half of the uh, you know possible combinations, if you get uh, zero, and for the other half, if you get one, so then you are uh, you know uh, input or the function is said to be balanced function, which means it is giving you uh, equal probability of uh, for the input values. Okay, so the equal probability is a test function. So that's that's a um, uh, oracle function. Okay, and uh, 
uh, what we call as uh, uh, you know the speed up here is just uh, you know 2x in a standard search uh, algorithm if you have to do this what you will do is you will simply iterate through all the values okay uh, and just bucket them into uh, zeros and ones and find out the probability uh, for the values and just till the output whereas uh, in this in this algorithm what we do is uh, the zeros and ones are um, bucketed uh, parallelly and so you are essentially getting uh, double the uh, the speed of the classical algorithm that's the only uh, difference that you get okay uh, so from a technical perspective uh, from a computational uh, capability perspective we do it only to save uh, 50 percent of the time and this is not too very significant uh, if you have to do a classical or a, you know classical computer versus a quantum computer uh, comparison and see which is uh, going to be um, important for us so um, uh, so we we can probably say in most of the scenarios we might probably be better off doing a classical algorithm here uh, but when your data space is extremely large, let's say again, once again, a uh, trillion data points kind of, those are the numbers we are looking at, then there is a possibility that we might use a deutsch oser algorithm, okay? And uh, um, so, so how does it actually, uh, you know, uh, actually work here? Um, so we, we uh, come at, uh, you know, the, we, we start with an oracle function. Okay, um, we start with the Oracle function, which is uh, going to, um, you know, value. So let's say we take uh, two qubit uh, functions, so two qubits for the function. Okay, and uh, uh, for for this function, let's say uh, we have four different uh, possibilities. Okay, if we have uh, the function zero to one tending to zero to one, then we have either the value uh, of uh, function to be zero or one or some uh, you know random value or it is one minus that some random number where uh, all of these uh, you know f of x where uh, the x is uh, between zero and one so uh, you might have any of these uh, values where x might be zero or uh, x might be one so in those scenarios you are uh, uh, the final function would be one of the values between zero and one okay and uh, so the, out here we do just one uh, you know query for the for the function of x so all the four different values can be tested at the same time when you are using a two qubit system okay and uh, and for that we will once again uh, look at um, the code but before we look at the code just wanted to give you an idea as to uh, we we are going to uh, test for four different functions so we are going to run it for four different uh, four different types uh, in the, you know in sequence so we cannot uh, you know perform this in parallel okay for each of the different values we are going to measure them okay and uh, if we measure them uh, we will find that um, you know the values would be uh, slightly different. So let's let's go back to this. And okay, okay. So if you look at uh, this particular uh, um, problem, right? I mean, uh, we are only uh, having uh, one uh, oracle function, which is uh, activated so we are going to only look at if uh, you know, if the function equates to zero okay and uh, identity matrix we use only because we are now going to check for the uh, zero values it's not going to actually perform any operation on the uh, bits itself okay it is just going to apply um, uh, an identity matrix so before that, what we do is we we prepare uh, uh, you know the the data uh, qubits. Uh, we ensure that uh, both the qubits are initialized. Then we are applying an X uh, gate for uh, the target. Uh, sorry for the control uh, qubit. And uh, for uh, you know the target qubit, uh, what we are doing is we are essentially applying a hedge gate. Okay, for uh, both uh, for both the qubits. 
now we are doing here uh, an operation where we are going to apply um, the qubit for either uh, for the hedge gate for either zero or one and then we are doing going to do an uh, you know uh, an i gate and uh, what why do we require uh, before measurement why do we require to apply a hedge gate because so that we have we get uh, equal uh, probabilities and we are not having a bias okay uh, in measurement we can also apply an identity matrix it will uh, simply reduce the errors um, but a hedge matrix will ensure that we have uh, you know we our probabilities are not skewed uh, by the errors so i mean uh, the, the skewed in the sense that it will it will correct those values because now you are getting um, you are applying um, uh, uh, equal probability for all the states okay and then you uh, measure the output <clears throat> okay so if we quickly run this uh, we let's say this uh, experiment a1 and i'm going to run let's say 1 0 for shots okay uh, so if we if you look at uh, the experiment it's going to take a while um, usually uh, this is because somebody else might be running it so across the globe it's always available okay. Uh, the other thing that we can do here is we can instead of uh, looking for one, what we can do is now we can uh, look for uh, if we are going to look for uh, the output, we are, we are going to test it for one. Okay, let's test it for uh, one. Okay. then what we are going to do is uh, we are going to uh, test it for three okay and uh, okay um, so one of the important factors why we uh, for um, you know testing the output of value of one why did we apply uh, x gate is um, because across the x-axis if we are performing the matrix operation you are essentially going to um, you are so skewing the value towards uh, towards one okay um, so that's that's operator that we do okay and um, for, for x why we are using uh, c naught across uh, both the gates is because we now want to uh, now control uh, the output gate right so we want to control the output gate um, the target bit uh, and the basis of the input but the input is already uh, it's it's already a probability right so when we do a c naught on the output so what we essentially get is that we are uh, we are inverting those values okay and uh, we are inverting those values and we are going to ensure that um, uh, you know uh, we are getting the probability of x itself okay because uh, when you are applying a hedge gate okay you are going to again um, you are again going to uh, apply the superposition for both the states okay and for the probability of uh, 1 minus x what you do is uh, okay just we'll, we'll go to the results okay so for uh, 0 and 1 if you see what is the output for 0 you will find that uh, it has given you a value of 1 which is which is completely which is great because it's not very often that you get a 100 percent 1 but in this case uh, you will find uh, 1 because what you are doing here is you are suppressing all other values and uh, you are running it in a simulator so your simulator is able to give you um, uh, you know a hundred percent value but in a, a true quantum hardware this is not going to be the case okay and if you go back to the editor for the search algorithm for with the probability of x okay and now if we are running it with uh, 1024 now what we do is uh, we are running a third iteration okay uh, so in the third iteration, when we are doing a, 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 a for x, when we are doing, uh, we should be getting for uh, zero one. Sorry, one zero. Okay. Now we go to uh, for. Now what we have is uh, we have uh, 
for the last one, which is one minus x. Okay, so for one minus x, what we are doing is we are uh, essentially applying the x gate, which means we are flipping the bits um, out here. Okay, once we are flipping the bits, we should be able to get the output of one minus x. Okay, because we are running it in the simulator, we should be getting one again. Okay, now you find this is zero one. Okay. So we'll wait, we'll wait for this uh, particular, uh, it's going to take a few seconds to complete. So there's an interesting, uh, you know, aspect that you might want to do. Uh, you might want to change this uh, sample program to uh, an identity matrix and uh, check if uh, if this identity matrix is going to impact your output. So that's uh, that's something that I want uh, everybody to try out uh, at their own leisure time. I'm going to share the URL for this. Okay. Uh, so out here, if you look at uh, for again for the probability of uh, one minus x, you have got um, you got the highest. That is the complete uh, uh, you know uh, probability of one. Okay. So that's that's a uh, answer that we wanted. Okay. Uh, so we had two qubits out of which we found the probability for one qubit at one time and second uh, you know qubit for another time, and we are measuring only the q zero. And we are not measuring uh, Q1, but even though we have, uh, you know, for both the qubits in the system, we are measuring for only one qubit. Okay. Uh, any queries in this? Okay. Uh, so we are going to uh, quickly go back to, and we are going to cover one small uh, topic here. Okay. And uh, uh, so there are other uh, search algorithms also. While uh, you know quantum search is uh, still an evolving uh, topic, okay, um, we we find that there is very limited number of uh, quantum search algorithms that have been truly built. Okay, um, so adiabatic uh, quantum computing and quantum walk both are uh, you know proposed as part of this particular paper. Okay. And they have been uh, mentioned in conjunction uh, with your uh, uh, with your Grover search algorithm. So uh, Grover search algorithm is still uh, the most popular, but uh, because it it already gives you uh, so much of uh, you know speed up, right? Um, so that's that's uh, one of the key factor. Okay, but uh, if you look at um, this particular uh, problem where they are saying that uh, you know your uh, quantum search, uh, quantum walk search algorithm, okay, um, or the uh, adiabatic uh, quantum uh, computing. So in uh, both the states, okay, um, you have fairly different approach, okay. So um, quantum walk, what actually it does is uh, in terms of rotation, um, uh, it does uh, similar to uh, what Grover's algorithm does, uh, inversion. Uh, but uh, it it's it's slightly different. Whereas uh, adiabatic quantum searching actually alters your original Hamiltonian uh, with very similar to your uh, quantum annealing approach. Okay, um, so this is uh, particularly useful uh, in implementing uh, in quantum annealing um, while a quantum um, universal quantum gate uh, computer can be used for this. Um, it is it is actually better solved using uh, adiabatic uh, quantum searching is better implemented using quantum annealing. So in quantum annealing, you might uh, want to look at uh, some of the D wave uh, you know uh, setup um, uh, D wave uh, logic. Okay, um, so D wave actually gives you a good ID to um, uh, you know to uh, to get, perform or rather try out your code. Okay. Um, so uh, 
so aqc in my opinion is uh, better suited where um, you can use a uh, you know quantum annealing it gives you a better uh, control and uh, it 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 naturally maps to the quantum annealing process because you are what you are doing is you are uh, performing an adiabatic operation on the particle itself quantum particle itself and you are also mapping the values to the uh, adiabatic quantum computation so your math model and your uh, physical material uh, adiabatic uh, you know process actually maps to each other so it's a natural fit that way okay um so uh, in in this particular approach what happens uh, from an uh, I mean, annealing perspective you are going to you see that the the particle tries to goes to the natural ground state okay and um, the time complexity for the adiabatic algorithm is very important here so um, which is actually directly equivalent to the time taken to um, you know uh, complete the adiabatic uh, process within the material itself so uh, the energy eigen values are um, you know for the hamiltonian representation so um, so if they are pretty large uh, so then obviously the adiabatic evolution is going to take a little time a little more time and uh, hence the time complexity is also going to be a little more but uh, specifically if you are going to um, you know apply the transverse field in quantum annealing in such a way that your energy gap uh, you know can can be closed faster okay um so uh, so it it um, you know it is much quicker uh, you know to to evolve okay and um, if uh, if the if the gap is small so obviously it's going to uh, evolve uh, slowly okay so um, so there are particular uh, you know approaches that you can do uh, but uh, you would be using uh, uh, aqc in typically a satisfiability problem so and instead of an optimization problem you might uh, adapt it to adapt the optimization problem to a more of a satisfiability problem and um, you can uh, you know the standard combinatorial uh, search problems so you can apply all of them um, so so if you look, if you look at uh, some of these uh, approaches uh, if you are able to map them to uh, an annealing process um, so you can solve it on uh, quantum annealer computers so which which is much more widely available today okay uh, so out here if you see why we don't use a quantum uh, universal uh, quantum computer is because in universal quantum computer you are looking at uh, uh, you are looking at uh, discrete uh, mapping values right whereas uh, in a quantum annealing you can apply arbitrary um, you know unitary operations here okay so that's that's one one particular difference um so uh, in in a quantum annealer you are actually having chains of uh, qubits so the chains of qubits uh, they uh, they are able to um, you know uh, they are able to uh, give you direct mapping of uh, adiabatic process as against your uh, quantum gates which will give you only logical uh, values and they are more discrete in nature so that's that's a, a primary difference okay and uh, if you look at um, uh, you know the the quantum walk uh, uh, algorithm so the the quantum uh, walk algorithm is uh, you can assume that it is uh, much much uh, what you can say closer to um, much closer to the grower algorithm as i said earlier okay and um, um, so the first step is uh, you know obviously uh, the continuous time uh, needs to be um, you know mapped to uh, different uh, qubit states so that's the first step okay so your uh, standard uh, you know equation hamiltonian equation if you want to apply um, you would uh, want to first uh, do a mapping from and you want to apply it on a quantum qubit uh, computer you want first step is to obviously map them okay for the continuous time uh, the equation okay uh, we need to map it to the uh, you know each of the uh, vertices of the graph so you can have a graph representation of each of the qubits and using each of the qubits and uh, you know 
so um, the 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 values that you might want to uh, apply so you want to apply it to all these uh, you know um, what you can say the nodes of uh, the the graph okay um, and your matrix representation when you are having uh, an adjacent matrix so uh, that can be uh, related to the edges of um, uh, of the graph and uh, and then you would um, you know apply the uh, laplacian uh, function okay and uh, when you are doing that uh, operation you are essentially mapping uh, the diagonal matrix okay uh, to your adjacent matrix okay and you are essentially performing uh, uh, an operation on them and uh, that is going to represent your uh, laplacian function okay and uh, now for the uh, you know when you start applying uh, you know uh, the adiabatic uh, sorry uh, the the quantum walk uh, through across each of the steps so you have to do an iteration for each of the steps and this iteration is going to give you the the least value okay which is going to uh, again you have to follow the uh, grows approach uh, of uh, rotation okay in grows uh, you know approach you have to do uh, x gate okay um, out here uh, you would do uh, do it on the y gate okay so that is uh, that's a uh, the slight variation that you might want to uh, look at okay and uh, the the performance you would find that uh, you know it is uh, fairly similar in in terms of uh, growers um, but it's going to be um, you know it's going to be uh, slightly lengthier in implementation um so that implementation is going to take a while so i'm not um, you know i don't have uh, an example right away to show uh, show that um because uh, uh, you know writing that particular function or uh, uh, solving that particular problem is going to be slightly longer okay um and it still provides you the uh, similar optimal uh, you know square root of n um, you know output um for a simple reason that you are uh, your parameterization if you look at uh, of each of the you know gates okay uh, it is very similar to grover and uh, again uh, what you have is uh, the energy states uh, through which it uh, rapidly processes the you know which is mapped to the values so that is also uh, particularly since they are discrete now okay so they are also particularly quick in nature okay and uh, hence our um, uh, reduction and our uh, overall what we can say the search performance is going to be very similar to the grower okay uh and why we call these as uh, hybrid algorithms because uh, we um uh, because uh, this is there are two steps to this okay um so one step is that uh, we have uh, the pre processing which we do in um, in the classical computer and subsequently the uh, you know the quantum kernel which is uh, going to perform this operation is uh, going to be uh, you know going to give you the output which again needs to be mapped back to the uh, hamiltonian which is not something that uh, you know we had to do in prover okay um so that's why uh, this is more of a hybrid approach as against the uh, the grower approach okay uh, any particular uh, question here okay um so we reached the end of the session um uh, and uh, uh more topics definitely will require more time so obviously um logically i think uh, we can we can stop here if there are no questions um we can drop off what i'm going to do in, uh, uh, at the end of the session is i'm going to share the uh, the presentation and I, i'm also going to share the um, you know couple of urls 
So one thing which I want uh, participants to do is to go to the quantuminspire.com and uh, you know uh, create their own accounts. There are free basic accounts which are available. Once you um, you know start that, you can start trying out all the uh, you know algorithms out there, and they do have a very good explanation of uh, each of the topics. Okay. Um, and uh, if anybody is more interested, we can definitely explore as to how uh, OpenQL, uh, Quantum, um, uh, you know, OpenQASM and IBM Qiskit uh, can also be, you know, uh, interoperated. So you can uh, supply, uh, you know, IBM Qiskit, uh, you know, composition and you can simulate it on uh, your uh, Quantum uh, Inspire um, and Quantum Inspire uh, problems can also take uh, inputs from OpenQL. So some of these, uh, you know, logic can also be, uh, you know, tried. So I'm going to share those links as well. Okay. Okay, there was one question uh, uh, at 12.41 by uh, Shubrojit Paul. Uh, is Quantum Inspire open source? So Quantum Inspire is uh, uh, it's 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 an open source in the sense that you do have the source, but then you won't have you can only have an access to the simulator if you implement it. But uh, they do have hardware also, and uh, they do have uh, the whole ecosystem, the APIs and everything. So definitely that is something that you will you will miss. Okay. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, uh, okay, can we simulate any type of digital circuits? So we can, um, we can technically simulate any of the digital circuits, but uh, if you are looking purely from a simulation it in uh, OpenQSM, uh, you will have to first, um, you know, translate all your digital circuits into a NAND gate and uh, NAND gate from, uh, you know, uh, CCN gate. And uh, then you will have to, using multiple CCN gates, you will have to arrive at a solution, which is not going to be very optimal. So, um, so if to if you want to solve any of the problems uh, using, um, you know, quantum computer, I would recommend that you directly look at uh, quantum circuits themselves uh, because they are usually more efficient. If you have uh, expressed something in, uh, you you know, using a standard classical uh, gates. Uh, like AND gate, OR gate and all in classical electronics. And if you are trying to translate to quantum, it's going to be very, very large uh, setup. That's the that's only thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then. Um, Sir, I think I'll uh, I'll take everyone's leave. Uh, it has been a pleasure talking to everyone. Uh, my email ID, um, I'm I'm putting it out here. Anybody who wants to, um, you know, um, uh, ask questions, share anything, or want to explore some topics, we can definitely have an offline discussion on it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Karthik, uh, for your valuable talk. And uh, I'll uh, I'll request the participant if they uh, have any queries, maybe. Uh, to be asked later, they may share with us or uh, the mail ID has been given. Uh, you can ask the expert directly. Uh, 